Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Bible Study Methods Class 5. Um, we'll um, wait for some people to log on so they won't miss it if they're wanting to watch it live. Of course, it's available later. You can watch it at your own leisure. <laughs> Sorry, having a hard time breathing today. But um, I am getting enough oxygen. Um, but I'm still having a hard time breathing. So I don't know what that's all about. So we'll just see how we do while um, teaching, shall we? You know, it's so dumb. It's like, it's like, I feel like the enemy has always tried to get me to just stop talking, stop teaching stop singing <laughs> or whatever. I don't, I don't know. It seems like you catch on after a while. Um, my phone's going to make some noises because I'm expecting a call from my doctor's office. It's not till 11, but I just can't miss it. So I'm going to have my little phone in the corner here. Don't worry, I won't be like playing Scrabble while I'm talking to you. <laughs> just kidding. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, um, thank you, Lord, that today we can gather in your name and gather in the the, the name of wanting to read your word um, more proficiently, with greater skill, um, that we would really be those workmen that are equipped to know how to mine the gold and draw the honey from the honeycomb. Father, we, um, we really don't want this to be one more class where we learn all these like things and then we walk away and it didn't do us any good. I don't want it to be that. I just pray there'd be some real stick to itiveness in the things that we learn about and our homework and the things that we're putting into practice. I just pray that there'd be some great teachers raised up from this class that you would send out. Maybe they wouldn't teach even like the way we think of it, like retreats and, but they'd mentor and disciple and, and teach people your word. Because Jesus, you said to go, you know, make disciples, teaching them to observe whatever things I've commanded you. And it's hard to teach people things we haven't been taught or we don't know how to extract, extrapolate. I forgot the word, but to take it out of something and be able to put it in a place where it's at someone's reach. It's not too high for them to get it. And um, it's not watered down. So only you can do that, Lord. So I just want to thank you for the ladies or the men who would be joining us this morning and ask that this be a fruitful time for your glory, for your kingdom, for your purposes. Lord, you know that we're in a bit of a quandary in our world right now. and um, We're all pretty vulnerable and people's... Um, Emotions are running pretty high. People are getting angry, arrogant. People are attacking each other, and accusing one another, and upset and scared. And just, um, would you please have mercy on the land, Lord? Would you, would you please send um, an, a remedy for the virus, Lord? And you would also um, help believers to remember that they're representing you to a lost and fallen world and that we would be careful with our our attitudes and Lord, if we've got a vent we'd find someone we could call or pray with or but not just you know vent publicly on social media or and they can't you know just wound them Lord. so father um we just need your help and i i pray that by getting into your word it would help us because we'd be able to um just swim, swim in the truths that you have and kind of um, enjoy things that don't change in the midst of, of, of a changing environment. And um, just ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us as we're gathered in your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so hopefully we're all here. We're all ready. Petey's here. He's learning Bible study methods. Right, Petey? You got it? Okay, good. That's pretty important. Thank you. He licked me. That means he did his homework. 
Okay. Uh, for your homework, uh, you had you were supposed to read prayerfully, learn how to read prayerfully, and one of them was to write out ten prayers for Psalm thirty-seven, and then pray out loud additional prayers based on Psalm thirty-seven. So teaching us how to pray, pray the word. So you were supposed to do that um, in class. We would share it with each other, but we're not in class. Then we talked about reading imaginatively. And um, so we were talking about you know, John 12, 1 to 7, um, talking about the location, the sounds, the sights, smells, noises. You know, like if you really take yourself there, this is when they broke the um, perfume, and you really like to think of how the whole room filled with this fragrance and the sound of, of something being broken. If you really sit there, and take in that story, not just words, but what the words, the picture, the words are painting in that house. Kind of picture where Jesus would be, where the girl would be, Mary would be, Judas, um, candles glowing, but we're at you know, night, the smell, the fragrance, the hush hush of Judas saying things under his breath, just kind of. Watching Jesus look at Judas, what does his face look like when he looked, you know, kind of disturbed at Judas? Um, really to camp imaginatively in a scene, in a scenario where the little boy gives the fish and loaves. You know, how old was he? We're not sure. It says he's a young lad, I think. And you picture this little boy going, you know, I have this. Or maybe he didn't offer it. I don't remember the exact account, whether they went to him and said, could we use this? But, you know, just a little boy willing to give what he had, his little eyes. What, what did his eyes do when he watched it be multiplied, what he offered? You know, thinking of just that whole miracle through the eyes of the, of the lad. So the thing is, every, every narrative in particular, meaning every Bible story that's a story, you can read imaginatively. Some of the precepts you don't read imaginatively. Um, if it's just commands. But when it's a narrative, a story, they're in the wilderness, walking into the tabernacle, um, the the veil ripping from uh, top to bottom, you know, what that sound like, you know, in there. What, what When the high priest went in and saw that it was torn, just imagining his face and what he saw, going to the place of the skull, of crucifixion, Golgotha, and, and, and what are the sounds that we're hearing? Do you hear the drops of blood? Do you hear people weeping, the moaning of those on the cross? Do you hear, um, you know, the steps of this on the, on the dirt with people with sandals as they're walking around? And you know, that's all part of reading imaginatively is really taking, taking yourself into the scene. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, super good at that. Um, Max Lucado does that too, but sometimes I think he puts in so much imagination. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's really biblical sometimes, but he still. I know he loves the Lord, and he's he's an artist by nature, and so he just does that. But uh, if you ever want to be stretched, I'm reading things imaginatively. Read Chuck Swindoll or Max Lucado, and they both go pretty imaginatively. They're talking about biblical text. At least it'll stretch you if you're not good at them. So then um, you're supposed to write Judas's journal entry that day. You know, like today I was at this house and and can you believe it? She, you know, and, and you're just getting into like his head and his mind. And then you're supposed to write Mary's journal that she wrote that night. Like, I was just trying to bless the Lord and I got judged for it. And you know, just these things are not biblical truths that you could teach from. But what it is, is it's taking us into the text where we're really experiencing the text before we actually take the words as they are and teach from them. But we're coming into the scene with an affection and a love and understanding that there's people involved and feelings and smells and sights and sounds and it makes the Bible a little less um, just words, 
But we understand the words are painting pictures. So that's how you learn to read imaginatively. You know, when you just do it sometime or act it out with somebody. That's always, I told John that he taught on the shrewd ser servant on Sunday. And I said, John, you should encourage the people while you're doing these parables that the families at home could act out the parable. And um, somebody could be the shrewd servant, somebody could be the, the, the um, I mean, the steward, somebody else could be the master, somebody else could be the people who owe the money to the master, and they could, you know, act it out. And there might be things that when you do that, then you go back to the text that jump off of the page because you took it in an imagine, imaginary area. It, not things that are uh, made up per se, intentionally to teach from. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. But imagining in so much as the text takes on life and it becomes part, it's a real event that really happened with real people, real feelings, real sights, real sounds, and um, real places. So that's just reading imaginatively. So um, you were also supposed to read meditatively, just to mull over the word of God and um, just wondering how that went. I can't ask you about that. So we're going to go back to reading purposefully tonight. Today, it's not same. It's our last class. There's no homework. Uh, reading purposefully. And it's titled Reading Purposefully because that's what the guy titled it that wrote the book. And what he's talking about, and it's the book is Living by the Book. Um, it's a great it's a great Bible study book. Um, but it has to do with the English language. Like you're purposely noticing the words and you're going to understand language. Imaginatively, you were like taking it into another realm. Now we're getting back to the actual written text and what the words are doing because words do things. Words um, you know, are powerful and words make a big difference. If you say, if if you clean the kitchen, I'll give you $500, it's different than saying, I'll give you $500. One's a conditional statement. One is just something I'm going to do. If you don't know something's conditional, you might get mad at me because I'm not going to give you $500, but you didn't clean the kitchen. So, you know, lawyers are word people, right? They have those documents have so many words, and they have to be so careful. If they use one word wrong, that lawsuit or that um, it last will and testament, all, everything can go to the wrong person. So words are very powerful. Uh, remember that the Bible is a book, and um, that's why we need to know how to read the English language. Uh, there's conditional words in the English language, like I was saying. For example, and um, Ega can say where we are on the slides if she likes, because I'm I've got the slides here, but um, that way anybody tuning in knows where we're at. Um, there's conditional words in the English language. Um, the word if, that means something is contingent or dependent on something else. It's a cause and effect. Then is an automatic result. Neither is a disqualifier. It's not going to happen. The word because means this is why. Or it means results can take on different outcomes. Therefore means because of this truth. It's very important because I posted a verse today um, in Facebook about our sleep being sweet and pleasant. But in, in actuality, it's the second half of a conditional, conditional truth. Because if you read before it in Proverbs 3, it talks about if you apply your heart towards wisdom, then your sleep will be sweet. It isn't just it will be sweet. It will be sweet no matter what. So sometimes when I post verses like that, I'm going, oh, I, I, I feel so weird because this is a conditional promise. But I figure, well, it's God's word either way. And people can read it, enjoy it. They can go back into the text and see what came before it if they like. Maybe it'll draw them into it. But it, that one was a, a conditional promise. And it had to do with if you live your life foolishly, you, you have insomnia and you have a hard time getting to sleep. If you live your life wisely, you have less things to worry about. Um, 
If you go throughout Proverbs, it uses words a lot, like if this, then that, or um, a so-and-so is like a so-and-so, gives you like, it's like comparisons. So um, for example, in Romans 8, 10, it says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So if Christ is in you, the body is dead and the spirit is life. Why is the body dead? Because of sin. Why is the spirit life? Because of righteousness. If we are in Christ, our bodies will go towards death because we're all born in a body that has been affected by a fallen world, but the spirit within us is going towards life. Now that's if we are in Christ. You can't just give a non-Christian that promise. It's, an, it's a conditional promise. Look at 2 Timothy 2.11. This is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Verse 13 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So there's another lot of ifs going on there. And that means we focus on the things that we have to do and the results of the things that come after it. Just understanding that simple word. James 4.2 says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. So you read that, because means the reason. The reason you haven't gotten the answer to your prayer is you didn't ask. Then you go to verse three. You ask and you don't receive. So wait a minute, I'm supposed to receive. Oh, but there's another condition. Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasure. So you're starting to break down the reasons why some prayers are not answered. And these are all English words saying because, 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 to help us understand how things work together. So if we understand the word because, we're going to better understand the truths that it's teaching us. Mark eleven twenty six says, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. It's a very, very serious statement. And um, I know that people contend about this one, but I'm not taking any chances. It says, if you do not forgive, neither, like then also, or in the same way, your Father in heaven will not forgive your trespasses. Now, we're going on now to observation. The more time we spend on observation, the better. Interpretation and application we're going to we're going to be able to experience. I just women are really good at interpreting and well and applying in particular. Women really are like well, what does this mean to me? I love them. I love it because you're just not into like bible knowledge. You kind of want it to flow out of your lives. But um observation is is very important. Um we we looked at it and it, and we I'm sorry. We've been looking at ways of observation. And part of observing and looking at things is reading patiently, imaginatively. Remember these as we've gone over them. We read patiently, imaginatively, meditatively, purposely, thoughtfully, selectively, and prayerfully. Now, let's go on past reading to more about observation. What are we going to look for in the text? after we've learned how to read and all that. No, not after. This is all happening at the same time. Now, observation, things that we're going to be looking for in a text, is first of all, we're going to look for things that are emphasized, things that are repeated, things that are related, things that are alike, things that are unlike, and things that are true to life. If you want these notes, just in the type in your um, 
email address and Agla will mail this to you. If you're not getting it all down, she'll um, email you these notes so you don't have to like be done with the class like this, okay? So if you want the notes, just put your um, email address and Egla will send you the notes so you don't feel like, I missed it. Ah. Also, this is going to be on YouTube later, and it will be recorded on my channel. I mean, uh, Facebook page. So again, we're going to be looking for things that are emphasized, things that are repeated, things that are related, things that are alike, things that are unlike, things that are true life. So first of all, emphasize. Things that are emphasized. What's emphasis mean? Emphasis means that we're drawing attention to something. There's an emphasis on it. And when we're reading the Bible, how do we know something is emphasized? Well, first of all, the amount of space. How much space in a book given to a topic? Like in Romans, there's 11 chapters given to doctrine. And there's only five of application. So you're going, okay, obviously the book of Romans, God's giving a lot of space on doctrine. So we got to realize this is a book dealing with doctrine. Um, if you're looking at, you know, if there's a lot of space given, many, many chapters for one particular angle, that's being emphasized. And the Holy Spirit is what he's talking about. It's being emphasized. Secondly, we're wondering about a stated purpose. Sometimes a book will just tell us why it was written. Like in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I would love to know those. Isn't that terrible? I'm like the person in the garden that wants to do the one thing that I can't see. Sorry, Lord. I, I'll focus on the ones you have given me. But I would like to know what those are, so that'll be fun someday to see. Verse 31. But these are written, these signs are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And not just that you'd, you'd believe, but that believing you'd have life in his name. So why was the Gospel of John written? Why were those signs recorded? The stated purpose. It says that they were written that you might believe and believing you might have life. So often when we are witnessing to someone, we steer them to the Gospel of John because John says these were written so people would put their faith in Christ. So a lot of times when there's new believer packets, they'll include a little Gospel of John because there's a stated purpose for that gospel. And if you're going to try to help someone believe in Jesus, you should use the book that says it was written so that they might believe. So that's, an, you observe, the stated purpose. In First John, there's a stated purpose. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 13, says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So now, okay, so now the letter of 1 John is written to believers that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So what is the stated purpose for First John? It's that we might know we have eternal life and continue to believe. So it means that we might doubt sometimes. Am I saved? Am I not saved? And, and, and we get scared like, well, am I really believing in the right thing? That First John is a is stated purpose. That book, that letter, is written to believers that they might know that they have eternal life and they might continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So that's one of the books that has a stated purpose. The book of Proverbs has a stated purpose. It goes into, um, this is written to the young man to give him discretion, knowledge. So that's one thing we can do. We know that something is emphasized if it's actually stated purpose. So the first one is we know something is emphasized if the Lord gives it a lot of space. If many, remember 11 chapters of Romans is doctrine. So we know that Romans is written for doctrine. The other way we know something is emphasized is if it says a stated purpose. This is why this was written. 
It doesn't mean either, though, that there can't be other reasons for those books, by the way. Just because it has a state of purpose, it doesn't negate God using it in other ways. Okay. <clears throat> Another way to understand emphasis is order. <clears throat> Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Luke 9, verse 1. <clears throat> It says, then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority. No, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Luke 9, 10. <clears throat> and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. <clears throat> then, dot, 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 this chapter seems to deal with order. Luke 9.28, now it came to pass about eight days after these things, Luke 9.37, now it happened on the next day, Luke 9.39, behold, a spirit seizes him, he suddenly cries out, it convulses him so it forms his mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. This, these texts are chronological. Then this happened, then this happened. So the emphasis is kind of the order that things happen. So by the time you get to the demon not being cast out, you're like, you know what, I'm going to read everything that happened before that because it sounds like it's written like, like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. After these many days, this happened. So there's kind of an emphasis on an order of events. And so that's something to observe or to see if it's emphasized. Is, is what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. That's another way to look at emphasis on things. Now, also you want to look not only at things that are emphasized, but things that are, um, oh, by the, oh, yeah. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Things that are related. Look at Acts 1.8. What is the order of the places mentioned and what relationships these places have to each other and how does it play out in the book of Acts? It's interesting because if you look at it, those places, when they're commanded to go and do that, um, you start to see the book of Acts goes in that order as the gospel is spread. So you can see like, and how do they relate? How do these different cities relate? These are just things you want to look at to better understand the text. Um, I know Bethany comes up a lot, and you know, where is that located? How far away from Jerusalem? How where is Galilee? That's another thing, like geography, just to kind of understand where things are. It helps your imagination. It helps you understand the you know, reading imaginatively, and also how things are related to each other. Um, looking at a situation and finding out who's who's literally related to each other. When you're looking at Elizabeth, and Mary, and you're looking at John the Baptist, and you're looking at Jesus, and you're like, that's so weird because they're actually family members of each other. So, or also just seeing just how anything might relate in a situation would help us better understand and observe. This is all observation. Another thing we want to look at, and you're looking at text, is things that are repeated. Terms, phrases, and words characters, behavior and incidents, and also Old Testament quotes in the New Testament. If we read patiently and thoughtfully, we will better be able to notice things that are repeated. This is one of the funnest things for me when I'm reading the Bibles. I like to sometimes go through a psalm and see like how many times one word is in that psalm, like trust or peace or because or... Um, uh, fear or, you know, like, is there a repeated term in that, um, in that section of scripture? Or if Jesus is teaching, is he keeps saying one word over and over again? Is he say, is he, like, like Paul, he says, rejoice in the Lord. I say rejoice like twice. Why? Like the, that's really important. If it's being said more than once. So anytime something's repeated, um, I like to see if there's like 
a lot of words in there that um, kind of, well, this is kind of goes back to relating, but it'll say something like, um, if you perceive the way of understanding, then the next line says, if you receive, and the next one says, apply. And you can see these three words related to each other, and you see it's a progression of truth. Like, I have to first do this, then do this, then do that. That's just looking at words in the text and how they might relate to each other. That's why if you know what verbs are, you write down all the verbs. If you write down all the adjectives, write down all the nouns and, and see, you, you might do the whole thing. Nothing relates, nothing's repeated. It was, it, it didn't help you. But other times you're like, whoa, you, you got something really neat from it. That's what happens when you mine for gold, right? Sometimes you're digging in one area, you spend all night, no gold. You do the same thing in another area and you find a vein of gold and you have the gold. So it's a fun thing to do, but it doesn't mean every time we do it, you're going to find things that relate or find things that are repeated. It's just one of the many ways to um, mine for the treasures that are in the word of God. Like in Psalm 37, there's all these repeated gardening and land terms. I don't know if you noticed that. There's uh, grass, green herb, land, feed, meadows, native green tree, the land. Also, there's a lot about eyes and looking. You will look, the wicked watches the righteous. Um, they look at the righteous, not seen the righteous forsaken, seen the wicked in great power, saw him and couldn't find him. All about looking, where they're looking at. That's repeated over and over again. Um, Another thing, too, is in the New Testament, any Old Testament quote that's brought up in the New Testament, that you know God wants you to, to observe that, that that's emphasized. It's an emphasis because he brought it into the New Testament. It means he, he really wants us to get that. It's emphasized. He repeated it again in the New Testament. When you think about the words, when they say, holy holy, holy, three times to the triune God and when that was said to him. Um, Psalm 136, his love endures forever 26 times. Now, of course, it was a song, psalm, so it was, it was um, written to kind of have a rhythm and it repeats it, but still it's repeated. So it's something that's emphasized. In Hebrews 11, we keep reading by faith, by faith, by faith. So you go, oh, this chapter has to do with faith because it's repeated over and over again. <clears throat> Things that are emphasized. Um, in Matthew 6, 19, says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But... Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we see here that it's talking about laying up treasures, what will be destroyed, what's being emphasized. It's emphasizing something that lasts and something that doesn't. It uses the word, he repeats the same thing backwards. Like, do not lay up for yourself treasures, but lay up for yourself treasures um, on earth where moth and rust destroy, in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, on earth where thieves break in, and heaven where thieves do not break in. Like, it's repeating the same things, again, contrasting heaven and earth. And so it's emphasized. Um, another thing that you can do sometimes is consider similar events in more than one place in the Bible. Like if you look at Daniel's story and Jesus's story, um, which is always so fun. When pastors do this, I don't know about you, but I'm always on the edge of my seat because you're like, oh my gosh, it's totally there. Um, Daniel 6, 4, uh, this is when Daniel was, um, they made the rule that you couldn't pray to anybody, but uh, you had to, um, only to their God. Um, and it says, the governors and satraps 
sought Daniel 6 4. Governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They couldn't. Um, There's no charge or fault because he was faithful. There wasn't any error or fault found in him. Then you go to Luke 23 13, and you got Pilate, when he called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. Indeed, having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. So you got Jesus and Daniel, both, they can't find anything wrong with them. This is another emphasis. When you find things that are like stories in the Bible that echo each other, when Joseph is sold um, for so many pieces of silver, and you remember Jesus was sold for so many pieces of silver. When you see these things that are alike, these are neat observations in the scriptures. And that we haven't gotten into like, well, what does that mean? How does it apply to my life? But when you find the things first, then you move on to what does it mean and how does it apply to my life? Um, that thing about Daniel and Jesus goes on, where in Daniel 6.10, it said, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. And then Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down. He prayed. And um, Daniel 6.17, there was a stone brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signets of his lords. The purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. And then what happened with Jesus with the stone? Matthew 27, 60. They laid it him in the new tomb, which is hewn out of rock. They rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And they made the tomb secure in Matthew 27, 66, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So just even recognizing, wow, Daniel had a stone over the lion's den. Jesus had a stone over his tomb. Wow, they sealed the, the, the stone with Daniel. Wow, they sealed the stone with Jesus. What Now we're going, what does that mean? We never got to what does it mean. We're only observing what, what happened. And we're observing things that are alike. So <clears throat> these are all things that you're just having fun writing things down that are like things that are repeated, things that are emphasized. And then later you, you, you get to mull over it. And you get to really ask the Lord, well, what does that mean? And does that mean that oftentimes we're, um, you know, that, that, that we're going to face times where we're sealed in our own tombs and it looks impossible to get out, but you get us out. And even if we do what's right, we still get punished. Daniel got punished doing what was right. Jesus got punished just being righteous. So what did they do? And how did God get them out of those situations? And is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? That's what you can go on to. But just to notice things that are alike. Then notice also things that are unlike. In Psalm 37, 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while the wicked shall be no more, he shall be no more, verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So you're seeing that, wow, cut off versus inherit, no more versus inherit. Then you also want to look for things that are true to life. Look at Luke 10, verse 38. Luke 10, 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Well, what's true to life? Well, first of all, that there's real people here. And they're at someone's house. And someone's overwhelmed with serving. It doesn't mean it's a sin that you feel overwhelmed with serving. 
And it, it happens. You get overloaded with things. Someone's bothered because they think someone should be helping them when they're not. Like, like a lot in the Bible is just observing things that are true to life, things that really happen in real situations. Then we see how Jesus deals with it. We can start discerning what's sinful, what's just normal human response. We can look at what triggers brought on certain things, what conclusions people come to when they're bothered, what what when people are, are stressed out, are they quick to blame? You know, there's a lot. Why didn't she just talk to Mary and ask her to come help instead of going to Jesus? All these kinds of questions that you can ask. And that's the best thing to do. Remember, we talked about before is all those questions that you write down, like, well, why this and why that? You know, I can't tell you how many times, because um, the study that John taught on Sunday is one of my most, one of the most difficult parables I've ever had um, problems with. Because I just don't get why Jesus is commending an unjust steward. You know, he's like commending him. And you're like, well, but, but he's unjust. Um, like, how? why would you use somebody unjust to teach your disciples how to be? But I had heard another pastor teach on it last year. And he, he opened my eyes differently. And then John, too. So, see, this many years, I'm still, I'm a Bible teacher. And I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> I write it down. I don't get it. But growing in our understanding of things and looking at things that are alike or contrasted. And even in that, that's a good idea. I should go back through that parable and use more of these. Like, well, what things are are normal and what things are repeated and what things are alike and what what in that s scenario is Jesus, is there a word that he's using a lot over and over again? Like John noticed, which I never noticed, is John said this guy lost his job and it says that he, uh, it says he quickly went and had all these people reduce their loans that they owed his master. And it was like at the last minute, right before he was going to be without his job, and where was he going to live? And then John goes, do you know how many things are at the last minute in the scriptures? And he went through the thief at the last minute, getting saved. Um, at the last minute, the lad coming with the few fish and the few loaves. He started going through all these things that were like at the last minute that things would happen. At the last minute, the Red Sea opened. You know, just, uh, I never saw patterns in the scriptures that God does so many things from our perspective at last minute and that it's okay and that we have to be ready to get that answer from the Lord all the way to the last minute. I never saw that pattern in there. Um, but Jesus did say that this, this he said that, this, that he commended this shrewd steward for thinking quickly and getting on top of things. And he was saying, sometimes the sons of light don't do that. Like we just kind of wait, what are you gonna do, God? And we don't we're not ready to 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 move out quickly and come up with an answer when it seems like something's stuck. And he wants us to be a little more proactive and learn even from this wicked person, not doing things dishonestly, but being being a little more creative when we're stuck in situations. So I am. Um, kind of understood that. And then he was also explaining like that, um, that lady who um, like would give justice because you know, he's begging for justice. And then she goes, oh, I don't care, but just because you kept banging on the door, I'm gonna do this or something. And and then sometimes I used to read that and the Lord's not like that. He's not like, oh, cause you're bugging me with your prayers, I'm gonna answer them. But he used like a wicked person. He says, even this unjust person, it's going to answer you because of your constant knocking. How much more will your heavenly father? So he even uses like unjust person to explain himself. Then he uses this unjust steward to explain us. And see, that's another thing is to go through everywhere in the scriptures where somebody's unjust. And how did God, did God use bad people as good examples anywhere else in the scriptures? Will help us better understand Luke chapter 16. That's it, looking for things that are repeated. Not just in the text, but in the whole Bible. Are there other stories that use somebody that would normally not be commended, but God's using them as an example to show you what, what you should do? 
that, that's the whole thing just blows my mind. It's a teaching style. And Jesus was a teacher. And so, you know, he, he, he taught different ways and he used different examples. Um, interpretation. We went from that whole first four classes up to now has been on observation. Because I think that's what we're least trained in. Um, you know interpretation. That answers the question, what does it mean? Observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? So um, to interpret scripture correctly, we need to understand literacy forms. We won't know what meaning God wants us to get if we don't understand how the things are written to communicate truths. In the Bible, there's different literary forms, means the way things are written. There's poetry, there's um, exposition, there's narratives, parables, prophecy, and proverbs and wisdom. You're great, Maureen. I don't even know what that means. Well, we're going to talk about it. Literary form, narratives. Narratives is like, this sounds like the word narrator, someone who's telling a story. That would be like Genesis, because you're reading through the story of Adam and Eve and Abraham, all those things. You know, we're following a story of someone's life. It could be um, in Matthew or Mark or Luke. It could be um, you know going through Exodus. Uh, now you have to remember too, even though some things are narratives, sometimes within the narratives, there can suddenly be uh, more of a um, like a prophecy in the middle of it. Like in Daniel, it's all about his life, and then boom, it breaks into prophecy. So not all books in the Bible fall under one category. Um, it could be a narrative, and then suddenly changes to prophecy. Um, Narratives have a plot. And so when you're reading a narrative, you got to get to know the people that are in it. Um, are they being commended or corrected? Do you, um, usually there's not an obvious meaning until you stay there for a little bit when you're just reading a story. Like when you're reading about Jacob and he's favoring Joseph and he gives him the coat of many colors, it's just a story, isn't it? But then you have to camp there. And look at all like what we did with the observation, and then go. What does it mean? What does that mean? And look at, and 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 stay there longer, um, to be able to go. Wow. Well, you know, it means that he favored his son. It means that his brothers were jealous of him. And then we get the application. What does it mean to me? You need to be careful about favoring people. Um, if I'm favored, people are gonna not like me. You know, we go, kind of go through that. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me um, or to anyone? And might I encourage you, when we get to application, try not to always apply it to your own life. How does it apply to the single mom, to the new believer, to the unbeliever? You know, like, what does it mean to them? Because that will give you a whole new understanding of the word of God, not just in your own lane. Um, there's also something called exposition, which is a straightforward argument or explanation of a truth. It's got really tight structure and it's very logically written. Two books that are like that are the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. It's very tight, just as like a textbook on something. It's just boom, boom, boom. Um, it's straightforward and it, the meaning is usually quite obvious. There's not a lot to observe except for repeated terms or things like that, because it's not a story. So you can't read imaginatively because you're not, you're reading things like um, all have fallen short of the glory of God. You can't go there. It's not a story. So you, it's just what it is. So you've got to read like, wow, what, all, wow, fallen short. And, and look in the text for anything repeated, anything emphasized. You know, you're going to use different observation techniques depending on different literary forms. Um, it appeals to the average person's logic and structure and order. And all the letters that Paul wrote, most of the, what he writes in there, just very straightforward, just uh, really easy to, to apply to your life because it doesn't take a lot to figure out what is being, what you're supposed to get from it. Because it's, it's clear when walk, walk in the light as he is in the light. And we have fellowship one with another. It's very clear. We need to walk in light. How do we walk in light? But if you go and take a story of um, 
who Joseph was Potiphar's wife, then it's a story that then has to be developed into truths, and then the truths are developed into application. If you do any of these um, exposition things, like in the, the truths are already just there, written, straightforward. Um, it's If you're new to teaching a Bible study, you might want to start with something like that because you don't have to do as much uh, work because it's just what it means, it just says it. And you get to kind of jump more into application. If you're kind of doing a new one, you want to find something in one of those books that like the, the letters, you can always read those and they're pretty straightforward and you can get into a lot of neat application. Um, if you like to do like a narrative, I love narratives because I love taking a story and seeing what God has hidden in the story, kind of for me to find and draw those out and then teach those. I think it's just wild, but that takes more work. You might not be ready for that. Um, there's also parables, um, and these are related to a narrative and allegories. It's a brief tale that illustrates a moral principle. Um, there are within narratives with the story of Jesus, and he'll stop, he'll speak a parable. Um, Nathan went to David with a parable. It's a brief tale that illustrates a principle that has a very powerful impact. But I want to remind you something about a parable. Every part of a parable doesn't line up like it's not like the book of Ephesians or Galatians or, you know, Colossians. Um, everything doesn't translate. Um, it's not given for detailed doctrine. It's given as a punch illustrating a main truth. That's why when we read things about the vines and if you, they're good for nothing but to be swept up and burned. And then everybody starts thinking, well, what does that mean that? I, um, what, this PC is in battery. Oh, is my battery dying? Well, that's not good. That's not good at all. Let's see. John, well, maybe I could do, John, I'm gonna see if you can come and help me real quick. John? I'm still recording. I, I, my battery is dying. So I didn't know if you could plug it in for me. Yeah. It's over there and it could plug in over there. I didn't know it would use so much of the battery. Of the it's over there. Or of the computer. computer. It's over there. It's right there. It's and it could plug in right there. It doesn't need the extension cord. It just it can plug in right here. It's plugged in? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't need the extension cord? No, it can go in that plug right here. Oh. Sorry, everybody. I didn't think it would wear out that quickly. Yeah, I'll take this in. Oh. What happened? Your, um, Sorry. Sorry, guys. Where is it? Where is it? Oh. Yay! Thank you, Pastor John Warren. Okay. Remember that parables, like when it says it's gonna take all the um um like the 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 branches that didn't abide and then burn them. And then people go, Oh, that means that we go to hell if we don't abide. A parable doesn't have every part of the parable lining up as a meaning. A parable is an overall like story. To, to give a punch of a truth. Um, we don't use it for a doctrinal thing. That's not what parables are supposed to do. Um, it's not a prophecy. It's not a near, um, it's not expositional. It's, it's, um, it's like telling a story to emphasize a truth. Not everything in has to line up with something else. That can lead you really astray if you look at parables that way. That used to really mess me up with parables. until I understood how you're supposed to interpret parables. That was a helper when I learned that one. Um, then there's poetry. <clears throat> poetry appeals to emotions as well as the imagination. And um, it uses these big words, parallelism, hyperboles. Um, these, are, these are ones like the book of Psalms, 
or Song of Solomon. The Psalms is written in a melodic expression and uses a lot of figurative speech. And the meaning may not be obvious by the literal words. For example, Psalm, 8, Psalm 58, 6. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Well, you know, some people think like breaking their teeth is rude, like you're, you're really wishing that someone's teeth are broken. But it's talking about the young lions. It's likening the enemy. Um, it's likening the enemy to um, to young lions, and the young lions are going to attack him. But if they don't have teeth, they're not able to tear him apart. So he's saying, "Break out the teeth of my enemies. They're like young lions." It's 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 a symbolic kind of a thing. It's not it's not like people say, "Yeah, well, in the Old Testament, people would pray that people's teeth would be broken." It's not it's not saying that. It's saying, "Take away their ability to devour me, my finances, my health, my whatever it is." It's 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 an expression that's poetic. So. Um, it's very important, not literally breaking someone's teeth. Um, in Song of Solomon as well, you know, when they're talking about her breasts being like pomegranates or whatever, um, they're not really pomegranates. So, you know, you got to know that there's different literary forms in the Bible. And that's where we get a lot of weird doctrine, cults, um, bizarre teaching, when people don't understand literary forms. It's one thing is uh, it's just like casting that mountain by faith, you'll cast this mountain into the sea. Jesus didn't mean that he wanted people to cast that mountain into the sea. And people who take it literally should take it so literally that they should know that it only meant that mountain if you're going to take it by those written words. But it was an expression saying something is huge as that mountain should be able to move out of its way. When you have faith, you shouldn't be intimidated by anything. It's just move out of your way and you just walk right through it. So these were, these were expressions that were given that are very important and very real. But if you don't understand literary terms, you can end up with the wrong, um, wrong doctrine and, and, and your faith can shipwreck. Because you start trying to do things based on the way you interpreted the scriptures, and they didn't. That's not the way they were really written to be read, and then you you get confused. Because I hate to say it, but there's a lot of people that just are kind of illiterate. They don't understand the written word. So when they go to the Bible, they say, "Well, I have the Holy Spirit, and I can do it." You know, yes, especially uh, like uh, like Revelation and things like that. That's the Holy Spirit, don't need a degree, but it's still a book and we still need to know about words. If you can't read at all, it's gonna be hard to enjoy and to interpret and to teach the scriptures. So just understand that there's poetic expressions. Then there's prophecy, that's challenging literature. One of my most difficult ones for me to teach. Um, I think I've gotten away from it. Like I've avoided it <laughs> as a teacher. I listen to teaching, but it's, it, it intimidates me because, um, you know, it, 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 it's very, it's a tone of warning and judgment. It proclaims the words of the Lord. It's critical to bombard the text with, with all kinds of questions. Whom is it written to? What is it about? What do the things represent? Has it already been fulfilled? Does it have more than one fulfillment? Because a lot of the a lot of prophecies have more than one fulfillment with it. Um, and finally, there's proverbs and wisdom. These are short, poignant nuggets of truth. Very practical, very obvious. They kind of say what they say, but sometimes they use like allegories or symbolism or poetic structure to give the point of truth. Um, it's often practical and concerned with consequences or cause of behavior. 
They're often the easiest to interpret, but the hardest to apply. Anyway, this class has been a very brief overview of some principles to help us study the Bible, to extract the gold, to be a workman. It is based on Howard Hendricks' book called Living by the Book. It's a little dry book for some people. I encourage you, if you like the book, is to maybe get some gals together, go through the book together. Because he has his own homework assignments after each chapter. They're very challenging. And maybe if you have friends with you and you talk about it, you won't get so bored or feeling like, oh, I don't want to do this. You know, but sometimes we have to do the boring stuff to you know, get in shape in our Bible, um, in our ability to interpret the Bible. Um, I, I hope we've learned better how to read and that we observe what's emphasized and we know the different types of literary styles and we move on to, to more and we be creative. Final verse I want to read to you is in Nehemiah 8.8. 8. So they read in the, in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So this is what we want to do, is help people to understand the reading. Um, keep listening to different people that teach you how to study the Bible. You might connect better with another person or the way they learn is a little more the way you learn. Don't ever think you have it down. I love to, I listen to people that teach about Bible, how to study the Bible a lot because they, they always have a new angle that I never thought of or maybe an angle I already know, but they like fine tuned it better. So um, stay teachable, stay open. And I hope, um, I know I was a little out of it, a little tired, a little hard to breathe, a little quarantined, but um, hopefully God used this in any way that he can. Shall we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these people who have been so kind and joining with me. And we ask, Lord, that you would use um, the things that were taught here, to, that your word would be rightly divided, Lord, and that your word would be enjoyed and your voice would be treasured. And Father, that these women would be and men would be better equipped to, um, to rightfully divide the word of truth and to enjoy Bible reading and Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.